Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and I'm in probably the smallest room I've ever been in in my life with another person. Hi. I'm here with Kanjit Kuna, who has a podcast called The Procurement Podcast, and she's going to be interviewing me on all things cost saving, service improvements, procurement, etc. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so I am your humble servant. Ask me anything you want. Uh, we're living it, so hopefully it's also going to be beneficial to everyone watching. We've been kicked out of the main studio, we have, yeah. so we're just in one of our small podcast rooms, but it looks pretty cool, doesn't it, with all the sound isolation and all of that. So um, why don't you start, Kanji? Okay. So welcome to the Procurement Podcast. This is the Procurement Podcast covering all aspects of um, procurements, which um, includes increasing costs of labour, services, materials, logistics and new technology, recruitment and many more. Um, this is my very first interview with the very one and only Rob Moore. He's a self-made millionaire. He started off in 2005 with a credit debt of £50,000 and he turned that around within two years and made multi-millions. He has now delivered th over 350 podcasts in his Destructive Entrepreneur. He has um, written over 14 books. He has over four, 700 properties and he has a multi-million pounds training business where he has helped thousands of people. And um, I'm, I'm privileged to be interviewing you today, um, Rob. And also Rob has helped me start my journey on this podcast. So um, it's only fair that I interviewed Rob first. Thank you. It's kind of a bit uh, humbling hearing you in, in um, introduce me like that. Did you say disruptive entrepreneur or destructive entrepreneur? No, destru I, I, know. <laughs> no, no, I know. I know. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for uh, allowing me to be your first guest. Uh, and I'm all yours. So um, all right, however okay. I can help, let me help. So my very first question, as this is the procurement podcast, is over to you, Rob. What does procurement mean to you? So on a basic level, on a simplistic level, procurement to me means winning some business, winning a client. Um, I think on a more business level, it means uh, looking at how a business can uh, procure clients in a more effective way, uh, reduce costs, m maybe be more efficient, um, increase their services, reduce wastage, etc. Okay, so as you have been um, growing um, yourself in, in your businesses, have you always thought about how do you manage your costs? Okay, so um, I'm not the person in my business that manages the costs. That's Mark Homer, my business partner. Um, I tend to be the chap who focuses on driving the top line. And then Mark tends to be the person that focuses on making sure there's some good bottom line left. Right. Um, so Mark has a very analytical cost controlling mindset. And um, to be honest, I think a lot of businesses are more focused on turnover um, and maybe a bit less focused on profit. And as they say, what is it? Turnover is vanity and profit is sanity. Yeah. So um, over the years, I've developed more of a inclination to manage costs. Right. Um, so what we generally tend to do is maybe every quarter or half year have a, a clean of everything we spend. So Mark will go through all the stationery, he'll go through all the suppliers, he'll go through all the, the fo you know, just like photocopying and stuff like right. that. And, you know, the um, colour ink versus the black and white ink. He'll go yeah. through all the wastage in the business. He'll make sure, for example, that we're filling the training suite that we own on regular days because yeah. obviously we have a, Mark and I own that and the company pays us rent. You know, we right. maybe look at surplus stock that we're, we're not selling. We maybe look at, um, we, we've got, we run about 800 events a year. Yeah. Uh, and some of those will have a higher margin than others. Right. Maybe because some of them have a higher price. Maybe some of them have a, a lower cost. Um, so we look at each event vertical. I have a profit and loss for each event, right. not just for the entire company. So we can work out, okay, well, that event actually makes net profit 22%. That event only makes 12%. Right. Um, obviously, you've got the human resource side of it. So are all your staff as efficient as they could be? Are your staff revenue generating? Um, I always track revenue per staff member as a metric in my KPIs um, to make sure that that's not reducing too much. As you scale up and get more staff, yep. your revenue per staff member can go down. Um, I make sure, so I'm just listing a lot of things yeah, here, but no, um, I make sure um, that uh, as many staff members as possible um, have minimum standards of performance in their contract, MSOPs, yeah. um, whereby like, for example, our, one of our sales, our sales team, we have two separate departments for sales, about 15 sales 
people yeah. we have the bookings team and then we have the, the sort of the business managers and the business managers would have to make a minimum let's say they'd have to sell a minimum six thousand pounds a month where they, they don't get commission on that because that's a minimum standard of performance and then they get commission above six thousand to ten thousand then they get a higher percentage ten thousand to fifteen thousand then a higher percentage fifteen thousand well, plus okay. so it's like a, a ratchet system so that we reduce our risk because as an employer you take all the risk yeah. you know like you've you've got to pay all the bills you take all the risk yeah. the employees don't take the risk um, Mark goes through all the direct debits once a quarter in the company and he just basically, if he's, if he's in doubt, he just cancels the direct debits and gets that all cleaned. Because over time, as you grow your business, you yeah. know, you can get lazy um, and you can have all this sort of fat and wastage, if you like, within the company. Um, Mark does all these random spot, spot checks a few times a year mm. where he's just checking that um, systems are being used properly that we're paying for. Uh, that systems work properly, that they're effective. For years, our server was just one PC. Right. Uh, and now we've upgraded to a bigger server as it's got um, worth it. We, ha we have 600 different places where our online assets are stored. Okay. So Mark's um, centralising that into one. We've had a three grand saving on that. Right. Um, you, having a Frankie machine internally instead of going out and doing all the postage saves yeah. us on the postage. Yeah, um, so I could, I'm kind of geeking out a bit like yeah, Mark on yeah. this. Yeah, so, 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 so it sounds like you've got your costs very much under control here, which is very good. Um, do you actually incentivise your staff to give come up with ideas mm. to help you save costs? Yeah, so we have this thing with our team whereby if they refer another staff member who stays with us a year yeah. or more, then they get, I think it's about £500. It may be, um, it may be a two-step system where they get half of it at one point and half of it at another because one of the biggest costs in your business is yes. recruitment. Yes, it is. I mean, we had to pay 20% for one staff member that was a six-figure salary and we couldn't get it down. We try and get it down to 15%, but you know what? It, it, it varies company to company. Yeah. But a 20 grand fee. That is a lot, yes. It is a lot. Now, by the way, you know, I'm not knocking, I'm not saying that that's wrong, because at the end of the day, would I pay a 20 grand fee for an amazing staff member that stayed with us five years? Yeah, if I couldn't find them myself. Mm. But then other times I think, bloody hell, I should be in recruitment, because that's yeah. like, you just got a database that you're, you're leveraging, if you like. Um, so... Yeah, so we um, we incentivise them to refer staff. Now, we track yeah. um, where all of our best staff come from. And by best, I mean stayed the longest. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily best, but, you know, that's one metric. So, you know, um, all of our staff who've been with us the longest, where did they come from? And usually the top two are one particular recruitment consultant who are good and recommendation from other staff members. Yeah. The next thing that we offer is if they come up with an idea that we implement into the business, then we'll pay them X amount of money. Um, that might be 250 quid mm. or something like that, because uh, we want to have, create this, um, the, the ideation from the staff and not just from the founders. Um, and also we allow any of our staff in, in their one to one meetings, which we do every month or any time yeah. to sit down with some of the managers or the directors or myself or Mark and go, hey, I've got this idea and pitch us the idea and pitch us what they want as a, uh, as a share of that. Right. So if, my, if a staff member came to me and said, hey, Rob, I've got an idea for a product. Um, I think it could make you a hundred grand. Will you give me a five grand pay rise when it brings in a hundred grand? If I if I believed in that idea, I'd say yes. All right, okay. Yeah. It's a bit like Dragon's Den here as well. Yeah, maybe. Well, I want you know, like at the end of the day, your team, your staff, yeah. um, and your customers and followers, uh, they're the people that are involved in the day to day of your business. That's right, Sometimes, yeah. as a business owner, you can be a bit removed from what's going on the floor. I mean, I have eighty staff in this office that we're wow, sitting okay. in. So, like, they know a lot more that what's going on in their role than I do because mm. they're so, like, I, I, you know, I want to humbleize myself to the process that they know more than me in their area. Yeah. If they don't, I, why am I hiring them? Yes, right. um, so, yeah, I always want to learn from them. And generally speaking, you find that um, if they're people will revert to selfish motives, whether yeah. that's time off or more money or some kind of praise or recognition. And that's fine. I, I think that's good. So, yeah, I want to incentivise, if you like, where we can. And, and by the way, I'm always open to more ideas. That's very good. So um, talking about recruitment, you also, through your life leverage, um, you do a lot of work around scaling up and VAs and recruiting in places like the Philippines. Is that something you um, adopt yourself here? 
Yeah, so um, my team have a lot of outsourcers. I wouldn't be surprised if we've got 80 staff, we've probably got the same amount of outsourcers and consultants that we use. The main um, place that we've sourced good quality outsources is Upwork. Yeah. Um, I know that my team have used the Philippines, which is onlinejobs.ph. To me, it doesn't really matter where they come from. It matters yeah. if that outsourcer does the job well that you yeah. want. Um, and there are many outsourcing websites. Um, yeah. So I would yeah. certainly recommend testing them. For us, Upwork, yeah. um, you know, Tom and Harry, who run the podcast agency and the media agency and this studio that we're in, that's where they use theirs. Now, I have one full-time PA and one full-time outsourcer. Yeah. And outsourcer is not really a fair word to call him um, because he's a general. I call him my legend. He's yeah. just, um, he can, he's my agent, my researcher. Yes. He, he, he buys all my, um, he, like, all my stuff, like if I want to buy a pair of trainers or if I want to research a new car that I'm buying. Um, he'll go and research all the price. He researched all the prices for my Lamborghini Aventador. He helped me buy my Ferrari Testarossa. Wow. Um, so he does a lot of personal stuff as well. Um, he, he manages a lot of my social media. So he repurposes a lot of my content. He reaches out to a lot of all my podcast guests. Wow. He does a heck of a lot. Um, now he's uh, British. He's from um, England. Um, and he has a very unique situation where he has to work from home, so it suits him really well. Right. Um, we've been working together now for 12 years, so if you're watching, I think you're a legend. Um, I've mentioned him a few times. Yeah, there. and okay. you know what? I recommend everyone. Now, look, I, you know, okay, you could say, oh, Rob, uh, you're lucky to have him. But when we started, he just did the odd job for us, yeah. you know, for a few quid here and there. And now he's on, you know, full time money and other benefits. Um, and the job suits him and it suits us. And I feel he's way more than a, an outsourcer. He's a partner. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, you know, like, but you can do, you can do that per job. A lot of people, like, they have this little bit of, there's like this big gulf between just them and then like a full-time outsourcer or a full-time PA or full-time staff. But you can outsource your bookkeeping. bookkeeping. You can yeah. get a bookkeeper to come over and pick up all your receipts, yeah. charge you 30 quid, and then they charge you 20 quid per hour and they do four hours worth of collating it all for the accountant. Well, that's way, you know, that 100 quid a month, not even, um, it is, it's just, a, for me, um, a no-brainer because if you do any sales or any marketing in your business, it should bring you way more yes. than a £100 pound for four or five hours work yeah. that it costs you. So often it costs you more to do these lower level admin jobs yourself than it does to hire them out. Yeah, that's good. And so um, you mentioned this um, partner of yours, he does quite a lot of purchasing for you. Is he negotiating all the prices for you as well and making sure you're getting the best deals? You mean Mark, my yeah. business partner? Yeah, no, I mean, no, this, um, this agency um, chap you mentioned that works from home. Um, so... He's not really involved in the procurement of our business, so he wouldn't necessarily negotiate with suppliers. Um, I am in the throes of hiring someone to um, help me with my grow my YouTube channel, and he's speaking to him right. on my behalf. Okay. Um, but like with stationery, suppliers, computers, desks, chairs, screens, and all the stuff that we might buy for the office, the flooring. We yeah. just recently redid all the flooring. Right. Um, all Candine flooring, which costs a lot of money. Um, so we have like um, an office manager. And I say right. that because she's more than that. But, yeah. you know, someone's got the, the, the technical term for someone who manages the office would be the facilities manager. But she's far more than that. Yeah. So she'll she'll go with sort of, you know, getting all the quotes and getting the best price. So we've got Mark driving it from the top. We've got Caroline who does it for the office and a lot of the supplies. Then my researcher kind of does it for me. And, um, yeah, you know, maybe it's a bit um, fractious. You know, maybe if, you know, we used a supplier like yourself, yeah. um, there might be some leverage in that. I guess um, to throw a question back onto you, yeah. when, when you're doing procurement, are you putting a proposal together where your fee is part of the saving that you make the company? That's right, yes. <clears throat> so go on, then tell us about that. Operate. So it's a bit of a no-brainer, our service is, but it's obviously got to be a reasonable spend in the first place but um, if there's no savings there's no charge mm. but, and, and what you do get is a free health check so that health check told you that yeah you are buying at the right price but where we actually what our unique selling point is that is the fact that we have the buying power so we're buying that those products for multiple right. companies so we can get into the um, we can get into those prices 
But the also other factor is that we are buying that product or service all the time, non-stop. So yeah. we, um, whereas most companies, if they're buying that product, they will be buying it every three to five years whenever their contract's renewed or right. whenever they need it. So they're not up to date with the market, whereas we are up to date with all the suppliers. We also keep records of their performance in terms of the service that they're offering, innovation mm. and other things that they can offer. So so you're using economies of scale to yes, help people are. make savings. But it's just not just savings. It's beyond savings. It's all about the service, um, what we can do around value engineering, whether they're What's value engineering? So say, for example, somebody's buying packaging and then the packaging they've, they've got quite a heavy spec on that packaging that they don't need we'll look at that and say actually if you reduced say for the number of layers of your packaging we could you could actually still achieve that right. um, same so, product so in increased efficiencies yeah. as well yeah so, so, so can i chuck something at you, you can, on, yes. on your podcast you can, yes. um so one thing that we find that is really common with especially stationary companies yeah um, but maybe other businesses are like this is they'll come in They'll undercut everyone. Yeah. You'll go, oh, great. Well, you'll move to them. There'll be a cost of moving. And then they will quite sneakily, incrementally nudge the prices back up again. So you sort of look back in nine months or a year and you could be paying more than the savings. So is that something that it goes on a bit or is it Mark's paranoia? And no, if does, so, how do you avoid that? It does go on. And how we avoid that is that's another thing with our services. We we don't we when we say we charge on the savings we charge on the actual savings so we do quarterly audits and when we're capturing the savings we capture the cost of um, moving over to another supplier as well so that's all caught in there yeah um so um the audits will reveal so the, the contract the prices are fixed for 12 months unless there's an increase in material price so for example if the material the paper prices have increased it, that's like yeah. they've got the supplies have to pass on some of that cost but we have it we, we have a calculation how we work that out and how that's um, ad adapted to the um, actual product itself mm -hmm. so um we manage all those costs and um, that can be managed but i do agree that you do have to keep an eye on those because if you're not careful the supplies will um will add those uh, costs on another trick that suppliers do is when they're doing their calculations they might say on this product we've offered you this saving so you and that, that might be one of the lowest price items whereas your highest price item they might give you a lower saving and then when you actually look at the overall contract you're actually costing you more because your higher price item is costing you more right because um you know this is probably not the the sexiest part of business but i think this is a fascinating important part of business uh you know that the simple um maxim if you like you know if you make an extra pound of turnover you've got to pay corporation tax personal tax and all your overheads got to come off that whereas if you save a pound on the bottom line you save the entire pound exactly. so you effectively make a pound yeah so mark has this saying every pound's a prisoner um, right. i.e he values every pound and mark probably values a pound saving over a pound extra made now of course when you're starting out you've got to go and make some sales but once you get to a, a, a critical mass and that can still be a one-man band by the way yeah. and i think personally a critical mass is you know once you've got to do a second round of analyzing all your costs or you get to the point where you can't easily keep an eye on the cost of everything that's probably the start of the stage where you've got to think about cost savings um because yeah. you know a pound saved is a pound a pound in profit yeah and often well, the way we look at that is actually for example in your business we'd say actually if we saved you this much money how many training courses would you have to actually sell in order to make that same cost savings because yeah. obviously in order to deliver your cost save um, um training you'd have to pay for all your stuff and all the cost of the training program and everything itself whereas the savings itself is only the cost of the staff member who's delivered that savings so that's quite a measurable um measurable cost to, to measure with the staff so um and i've done it with with a pub chain i've worked for uh, how many beers would you need to sell in order to make yeah. the same cost saving so it's quite it is and it does affect the bottom line and you don't have to actually just put it on the profit line it's something you can increase your marketing activity and use that money to um, increase your sales that way as well so there's a lot you can do so as my saying goes if you don't control your costs then you're missing it's an opportunity lost yeah so there's a couple of other things. Could I carry yeah, just course, yeah. discussions, a couple of things that, are, that come to mind? Um, the next thing is the time factor. Yeah. So I guess companies like yours exist um, because there's a time cost element uh, like 
for me, this is not my natural flow. No. So if I were to go in and do all this cost control in my business, it would take up probably 20 hours of my week. Yeah. Um, and of course, if I'm worth £5,000 an hour in terms of my selling ability, yeah. then that's a, an opportunity cost of time. Yeah. So, And I think there's two extremes there. One extreme is whereby you're just not really doing any cost control. Um, and so, you know, you're just maybe a bit lazy, bloated, there's a lot of wastage. Then there's the other side of it, which Mark falls into sometimes, yeah. which is, you know, you get into these diminishing law of returns because you're so much active in cost control. You spend hours saving pounds and pence. And I guess there's got to be a balance between the time that you invest yeah. um, to make big savings where it doesn't become diminishing law of returns. Yes, that's right. But that's why... That's why if you use somebody like our company, then the, you do, it's, your invoice is going to be, say, for example, you were paying £1,000 on that invoice a month and you notice then that, that, that you were paying £800. Our, our um, cost will be coming out of that. So you'd be reducing your cost to £800 without, without using any time of your own. Mm. So that's why that's the benefits of outsourcing that somewhere else and using that model. Yeah. Okay, cool. Got any more questions for me? Um. So... In terms of your business, um, where do you wish you were now? Uh, well, on the one hand, I'm really happy with my journey and you know what I've achieved and where our companies are. So I don't sort of feel much remorse or regret that I could be bigger. Um, but to answer your question, to give you something, yeah. it would be that... Uh, when my son was born, so this was when I was 32, I'm 40 now, yeah. eight years ago, had my wife not dropped the bombshell on me that we were expecting, um, I probably would have taken Progressive more global earlier. Um, right. So, you know, like I had delusions of world domination and grandeur when I was in my late 20s and maybe early 30s. Uh, and I'd say that's not as important to me now. Right. But this year we are um, moving into five, maybe more new countries. I'm going to do that progressively and not too quickly or aggressively because I don't want to, you know, risk everything that we've built. But had, you know, like in a parallel universe, we'd be global by now. Um, mm -hmm. And we're not yet, although my podcast is listened to in 194 countries, I believe. And That's I've got amazing. a lot of followers in a lot of different countries. So if there's one thing I might do different or in another world, maybe feel like we could have done by now, by my 40th birthday, which was yeah. just recently, it would be we could have a bit more global reach. But no regrets, because obviously spending time with my kids is way more important yes. than me going global. And I've got plenty of time. You have, yes. And, you know, like... Um, Oh, like Warren Buffett and people like that who are still fighting fit and loving business in their 80s plus and Charlie Munger, mm. you know, like, yeah. oh, I want to be like that. I know That's I'll still right. be loving business when I'm 80. So not, not, not too many regrets. So, so you've retired a few times, but it sounds like you're the type of person that will actually never actually retire. Yeah, well, I, I think um, I know how to retire better than anyone else because I've retired so many times. Yeah. It's like my dad knows how to give up smoking better than anyone else because he started and stopped and started and stopped right. and started and stopped. Right. So, you know, I retired in my late 20s, early 30s. I became a millionaire between the age of 30 and 31. And I remember that because I wanted to be a millionaire by 30 and it was, I was a few wow. months late in my goal. Um, and then, I yeah, I've retired a few times since. And for me, retirement is always a weird... Um, experience whereby like I tend to retire when I get the most overwhelmed yeah. um, and then within literally days I'm then bored yeah. so I, like I'll end up not even meaning to start new stuff and I'll start new stuff I'll start writing a new book I'll start doing a new yeah. podcast I'll launch a new program I'll, I'll end up in some kind of new JV and before I know it I'm really busy again so last summer um, not the summer just gone so the one before um, I basically did no work. I didn't right. work for months. Um, and I was living, living off the philosophy of my book, Life Leverage. Uh, and then probably, I don't know, three months ago, I got this real itch mm. to jump back in and go big. And I wonder if it was because I was moving towards my 40th birthday. Wow, okay. um, and then when my 40th birthday came along, I watched a really impactful documentary on Alexander McQueen. 
I wanted to get progressive to the 20 million pound level because we'd yeah. sat, our best was 19, we'd sat at 15 and 16 and I thought, I want to smash through this 20. Yeah. I want to take us global. So I've unretired myself yeah. and I'm doing a decent amount of stuff at the moment, but loving it, really enjoying it. But I know what'll happen. A few months down the line, I'll be like so overwhelmed. I've got so many things on yeah. and, and I want to take a few months off again. And But the good thing is, I, I have the ability to do that because I have 80 staff and I have yeah. a lot of properties and all that yeah. kind of thing. So as long as I've got the choice to be able to pivot across. Yeah. Now, some people are very consistent individuals. I love variety. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to be retiring and unretiring and semi-retiring on repeat for the rest of my life, I'm sure. And what is your vision going forward? Because you are, you've got your brain sort of works at, I don't know how many miles per hour, but I think it seems like you've got ideas coming out all the time. So where, where do you see yourself in... Um, I don't know, in the next 10 years? So um, for me, I just want to keep growing what we're doing. Um, like, I'm not like Elon Musk where I want to uh, populate Mars or, um, you know, like uh, make the moon habitable. Like yeah. Naveen Jain, who I interviewed on my podcast, is a, million, a billionaire. He's the only person that's got a license to mine on the moon. Wow. And he's trying to let, use the radiation to turn that into energy, you know, usable okay. energy. So these guys have got mega amazing intergalactic visions. I don't have one like that. I just know that I want to continue to grow my reach, my impact, yeah. my exposure, my following. Um, for me, my vision is linked to helping people financially and in business. Yeah. Um, so to start and become an entrepreneur and start and scale their enterprise or to get better financial education. And for me, yeah. that has got to be global. It can't be local or national anymore like it has been in the past. Yeah. So really, my vision is to help people um, become better financially educated and start and scale their own business. Yeah. That's my own personal vision. Um, and, you know, like I've got to carry on doing that for the next 50 years to probably even reach one fifth of the people on the planet. Um, and, you know, I can do that through my books, my podcasts. I can do that through being interviewed. I can do that through my, growing my training businesses. Yeah. I can do that through doing joint ventures. I can do that through um, getting involved in other companies. I've, I'm talking to three companies at the moment about being involved in their businesses and, yeah. you know, having a, a share in their business and adding value yeah. to them so I can grow that way. Partnerships across the world. Yeah. Um, so I'm clear, but I'm also not like so clear that I'm rigid. Because I think sometimes if your vision is so clear, it's rigid and you can't adapt and evolve to the yeah. opportunities that come your way. OK. And um, do you think you're going to outgrow these premises because you seem to have more and more stuff in here? And I know you own these premises, but are you looking... What do you think you're going to do? I'm definitely going to outgrow this room. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> this is like the smallest box ever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when Mark and I started Progressive, we were in my tiny two bed house in a, in a tiny little dining room, which was hard. In fact, in the dining room, we had an, a fold out table because it wasn't wow. um, big enough just to have a, a proper dining table. And then we were there for two or three years. And then we got our first little room in an, an office, which is probably about four times the size of this. Right. Um, and then we got another room and another room and another room. And then we bought our own um, office which was a quarter of the size of the offices that we have here then we bought next door then we bought the building just literally over yes. the road there yeah. um, one of the halves and then we bought the other half and knocked the wall through so we've got a big training suite and you know within one year we will have to move again yeah um, and so we're we're near we're pretty much at 10,000 square foot now um, and that houses a, a media studio with two podcast booths and a big live studio uh, and about 80 staff with a couple of meeting rooms. But we're busting like within our next five hires will be full. Yeah. Um, so we're going to need to go 15, maybe 20,000 square foot because, you know, you'll know from procurement. Yeah. Um, if you move too soon, then you're in a space that's too big yeah. and there is a wastage of costs. Right, yes. If you move too late, there's damage and attrition in your business. Yeah. Um, if you move and you get a place that's not big enough to grow, you might need to move again in a year or two. Yeah. And you don't want to do two moves where you could do one move. Yeah. Um, I have got my eye on a, a, on a building, which is News International, which is just over there. It was where I crashed my five-day-old Ferrari. Right. Okay. And I would love that building. And at the moment, with our training facility and our staff, we could probably fill... What two fifths, maybe I push a half of it, yeah. But then the other half would be empty, and what would we do with that? So, yeah, like we, we, when you're at our size, which is 
you know, I, I guess in real terms, we're just into the medium yeah. size enterprise. We're obviously not a Google or a Facebook, yeah. but we're by no means a mom and pop exercise either. You know, there's not that many spaces. Yeah. Um, there's the um, American Express building just over there, which we would be perfect for us. There's this News International, which ideally, at the, which in reality at the moment is a bit big for us, but I'd love that. Yeah. There's probably only about eight or nine other buildings in the whole of this city that's right for us. Right. Um, so Mark's always on the lookout to try and get deals. Mm. Um, and now the good thing about Mark and I is we're also property investors. We own quite a lot yeah. of property. Uh, and so we'll end up buying it ourselves and renting it to the company. So we'll probably get the capital allowances or so we'll save a, you know, on a big building, we can save like more than a million pound in tax. Yeah. So, yeah, it, but it's one of those sort of, it's a bit of a, a, a dichotomy. When do we, when do we move? Mm. If you, if you come back here in six months, we'll, we'll get to a point where we can't hire any more staff. Right. We'll have to have like five staff in here. Okay. Which is not going to work. <laughs> so what about, um, your, you've got the lettings idea. Would you not con put, consider putting them in a separate office? Well, yeah, I mean, um, we, they've got to choose that. We can't just kick them out because yeah. lettings is one of our business. We've got another business partner. Uh, and they've obviously got, I mean, if, if you go into the letting agencies, they're really nice. And they, they've actually made spent a decent amount of money on the way it looks, probably yeah. more so than our main company. Right. Um, okay. And yeah, like they're outgrowing that space. And they're having the same quandary because what they wanted to do, and I say they because I'm involved in both businesses, but yeah. they wanted to nick a bit of our space right. so that they didn't have to move. Yeah. Um, but if they nicked a bit of our space, we've reduced space and then we have to move quicker. So, yeah, maybe if they if we find a, a suitable space for progressive lets to grow, then they move and we've got room for maybe another nine or ten staff for a small training facility. Um, but. You know, unfortunately, commercial properties aren't just like widgets where you can go, right, we need a unit that's 5,000 square foot, we need it now. Yeah. You know, like, okay. sometimes it can take a year or two to find the right space. But yeah, these are, I mean, every board meeting we have each month, this comes up because it's becoming like a big issue now. Also, we've just invested probably £35,000, maybe more, we're not finished yet, in this new studio. Yes, so we've got two it. podcast and audiobook booths, which are fit for purpose to do audiobooks for Audible, yeah. which you have to have a, a, a proper quality level. Yeah. We've got a, a live stream studio in there and all the equipment. Now, if we move next week, there's a sunk cost of about 15, 20 grand in that, because we can yeah. take the equipment with us, which we never get back. So you're balancing, like Mark doesn't ever want to move that much because he reckons our last move cost us about 85 grand. He reckons our new move might cost us 150 grand. Right. But then you've got to think about loss of business when you're moving. And the bigger the company you are, the more expensive the move is. Yeah. You know, what if, you, what if your internet isn't up for two weeks? What if you can't get your phone system in and your sales, can't, sales team can't do calls for two weeks? Yeah. yeah. So what about energy efficiency? What are, your, what are you doing around... Um um, your energy efficiency, because I know you mentioned something before that you're uh, looking to... Uh Turn the heaters off. <laughs> I'll tell you what Mark's done. Uh, Mark, um, this is no word of a joke. Um, with the aircon units, you yeah. know, the control, yeah. Mark got a glass case with a lock on it right. and he covered the aircon unit so only he with the key could change the aircon. And how often is he here to do that? Um, yeah, well, not, not so much. Um, it, honestly, I mean, we are active in that, in that it's not something that we flippantly aren't in, interested in. Yeah. We're removing all the plastic yeah. from our company now, you know, and all the, all the bottles, they drink a lot of water, and we're starting to remove all the plastic. You know, we're trying to be conscious about maybe our carbon footprint. Yeah. We we're active in recycling and things like that. Mark definitely does try and make sure that when the air con is on, the windows aren't open. Um, but that's really his area. And if I said any more than that, I'd be above my pay grade. Okay. Yeah. And then just a question on your property. I know that Mark deals with the property side a bit more, but in terms of like your HMOs, how do you control the cost there? It, what costs so do you mean? So you're going to have your costs, like you're gonna, you've got to pay for all your utilities and cleaning and all those yeah. sort of type of costs that, like that. So I'm pretty sure Mark has one supplier that he uses for all of the properties where possible to get economies of scale. But what he does is routinely price shop once a year because right. what he finds is if he changes it once every one to two years, he can get a much better deal because, yeah. again, they eke e e up their prices, etc. But when you do it for... When you do insurances and utilities and even cost up refurbs 
for dozens or hundreds of properties, you obviously have more leverage and more economies of scale. Yeah. And probably when you do it for individual properties, it's almost not worth your time to do so. But yeah, I know that it, that is something that he does uh, and centralizes all of that supply where possible. Okay. And as your um, headcount is growing, how are you managing your um, increasing cost of labor? How do you mean when the increase in cost of labour? So labour, like the, the uh, some of them obviously are going to be above the national national minimum wage, but those that aren't, are, have you got have you got many that are on the um, national minimum wage? Because that affects quite a lot of com- companies. Where, where so do you mean just the um, overhead of having staff? Not just the overhead, but the, each each year the um, minimum wage keeps going up. Right. So I don't know if you've got any staff or that are on that minimum wage. I'm but... pretty sure we have no staff on minimum wage. I'm pretty okay, sure so all you. staff are a, a fair amount more than that. Um, you know, like I can't say that we're the best payers in the county. Yeah. Um, and certainly in Cambridgeshire, there's Cambridge where the wages are higher. But we do try and be really competitive with that. In the past... You know, we've tried to get people on the cheapest salaries. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you can get someone on, say, 26 grand yeah. who's really not that great. And you can get someone on 29 grand who's really good. Yeah. And that's, what, 10% more, yeah. but they're 500% better. Yeah. So um, if I think they're good, I'll pay probably above the going rate. Uh, yeah. Now, of course, if they're not good, you know, you get what you pay for. But for a small increase in um, wages, you can often attract the better quality talent. Um, what I also find when we do recruitment is that we, um, when we do interviews, I try and interview different people at different salary levels. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you can put out for a salary that's out there and you'll attract those kind of people. But sometimes you can get labour a bit cheaper. Sometimes you need to get a better quality. So if they say, what's the salary for the job? You might say 40 grand, but say, hey, look, I'll interview people at 30 and I'll interview people at 50. Yeah. I'll interview people at 80. Yeah. Um, like in marketing, you know, like sort of someone who deals with global marketing or big marketing strategists might be 80 grand. Yeah. And someone who's a bit more tactical might be 40 grand. But I still want to interview those people yeah. um, to sort of be able to compare them to each other. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like overall, and I guess not everyone is going to agree, but overall we pay well. And we think that that's the investment in people, I think, is often the best investment. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I agree with that, yeah. not everyone is 100% happy in your company all of the time. That's impossible. No. But we have, um, we pay more holiday and we allow staff to buy and sell holiday. We have um, more benefits than of around the main employers because we've researched them all we let them choose their benefits so rather than it being imposed upon you you get to to pick from a menu of eight benefits and you get to pick four of them so they're bespoke because some people don't want dental some people do some people don't want gym some people do some people want to buy holiday because they want more some people want to sell holiday because they want less And we found that that's been really good. We have a social team as well. So that that we've got a team in the office that are um, involved in our social events and they can come and pitch the directors if they want a budget. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, something, something, I know you're very successful, Rob, but um, if I had to ask you what something you failed on, what would that be? Uh, um, Well, I failed as an artist. I failed as a pub landlord. Uh, and I failed um, as an architect. So those sort of, I wouldn't say I tried them seriously as a business because yeah. I didn't, I wouldn't really have called myself a businessman back then. I was just someone who was trying to work for themselves, moving yeah. into a career that I didn't really have a, that much of a passion for. Art I got the closest because I was actually good at art, whereas I wasn't good at architecture or running pubs. But um, I just didn't, I hadn't managed to commercialise it. Um, m- now... This might not be the answer that you want, um, but I won't judge. I'll just answer truthfully. And that is, I don't really see failure as failure. I see failure as a way to improve. I see failure as a, um, you know, we we all make mistakes. If you're not pushing, you won't make mistakes if you don't push at all. But um, 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 the biggest mistake to make is probably to not take a risk and to not push forward and to stay comfortable. Yeah. So um, I could list a million things that me or Progressive Property have cocked up, whether that's email marketing to the wrong sequences, whether it's doing live streams and having 20 and 30 minute tech fails. And, and often they're not my personal fault, but it's my company. 
Um, yeah, we've had joint ventures that maybe haven't lasted as long as we want or partnerships that we've had to mm. break. Thankfully, we've never been in an employment tribunal, but that's probably going to happen one day. We've got close a couple yeah. of times and we've had some arbitration. Um, but, you know, that's a pretty good record considering yeah. that we've hired hundreds of staff. So for me, a lot of the mistakes we made ended up making us better. Yeah. So I can't sit here and say there was this one epic cock up we did. There's actually... I tend to fail a lot, yeah. fairly small, right. and then every now and again, like crashing my Ferrari into News International, or yeah. <laughs> I get a lot of speeding fines. And if it was me, like absolutely thrashing my cars, it might sound exciting, but it's like thirty-four in a thirty. Yeah. I've been flashed twice on the speed camera just down the road from my house. I mean, it's there; it's been there for yeah. years. Who doesn't do? Who yeah. who does that? Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, I digress somewhat. Okay. So one final question for you, Rob. So you've written many books. What's the next book you're going to go for? Okay, well, I've already written my next book. It's called I'm Worth More. It's with my publishers, uh, and they're going to launch it later in the year. So that's done. Um, you know, when I write a book, I want to try and reach more people to the point where I've got a book that reaches maximum people, and then I might niche back down again. Um, I've got probably 16 or 17 book concepts I'd like to write, but obviously I can only write one at a time. So that's my next book, I'm Worth More. That'll be out, I think, July. Right. So it's a bit of a wait. Um, but I'm also writing, and I'm about a third of the way through, and he's been very patient with me because okay. it's taking time, but I'm writing a book with Gerald Ratner called Reinventing Yourself. Right, okay. um, and I'm sort of ghostwriting that with him. Mm. Uh, and then after that, I'm meeting my publishers next week, and we're discussing either some kind of mindset book Right. Um, but I want to write a book about um, sort of putting yourself out there more, building yeah. like a, a, a brand around yourself yeah. uh, and standing out and gaining attention in a very busy world. I think that that would be a great book. And I've got a concept for that. Right. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want it nicked at this stage. Okay. Um, I want to write that book next. Right. But my publishers at the moment want to write me to write the mindset book next. Um, but I want a good, unique concept for mindset if I'm going to do it. I just want to write another mindset book. So I'm meeting my publishers next week and we're going to brainstorm that out and um, uh, I'll be writing one of those two books. It depends who's most compelling with their argument. Sounds very good. You just come out with, um, when you're writing a book, do you just come out naturally with lots of things to write about? Yeah, well, I only write about stuff I know, I do, I live and I breathe. So, you know, there's plenty of good authors out there. I'm not knocking this as a way to write, but it's not my style, who do research projects. Yeah. Um, but I don't. I write what I live, I breathe, I work, I do, and I love, and I've solved. Right. Um, and then that one makes it a lot easier for the content to flow. I think that's also more credible. Yeah. Um, and also, if I'm passionate about it, that's going to come through. So, you know, when I wrote about money, that was because I got myself out of a lot of debt and, yeah. you know, made, I've been skint and I've been rich. Yeah. Um, you know, when I wrote Start Now, Get Perfect Later, um, when I wrote that concept, my MD said to me, you are the perfect person on the planet to write that book because yeah. you just get stuff done and get it out and you fix it as you go and you're not yeah. too worried about make tri you sort of the trial and error and the tests. Yeah. I wrote Life Leverage when I retired for Very like the third question. time. Thank you. Um, so I write, for me, I'm always going to write that kind of stuff. And it, make, it also makes the research easier because, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I've still got to research stories, anecdotes, examples, check facts. Sometimes that's important. Um, but, yeah, that's my style of writing. OK, well, Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. And um, you have made my first podcast quite enjoyable and quite relaxing. So there'll be more to follow. But uh, thank you very much for All your right. time today. Thank you. OK. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.